All right. Um, good, good, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. Welcome to the Global Innovation Management Institute Think Tank, Jimmy Think Tank. We've been running this think tank for the last four years now, and we've been basically meeting with different people, interesting people, talking about innovation. We talk about three very specific things about innovation. Either what are the trends, the future? Where's the future going? What are the trends? We talk about innovation management, which is basically how to do innovation faster, quicker, cheaper, to be able to do bigger and bolder things. And then we talk about specific uses of innovation, whether in countries or in different applications, like a classroom or a university. Today, we've got a fantastic speaker about classrooms without borders. Um, I, I think you guys are gonna learn a lot. Let me assure you, change is coming. Change is coming to the way we teach, the way we learn. And um, I think we're going to have um, a lot of insights coming from our speaker today. Um, introducing our speaker will be Alba. Alba, come on, join me. Uh, I want you to introduce the speaker. Sure. It is a great pleasure for me to present our uh, special guest that we have today, which is Professor Ai Addison Zhang. She is the CEO and founder of Classroom Without Walls, and uh, she is an award-winning educator, consultant, and coach. She received her master from Syracuse University and PhD from the University of Maryland, both of which are in the U.S. Dr. Ai also serves as an Adobe Education Leader, Adobe Insider and HubSpot Academy instructor. She wor her work has been featured in Glamour Magazine, Forbes, Inside Higher Education, Pearson Education, Entrepreneur, The Today Show, and others. She also uh, is a highly sought after speaker, having spoken at TEDx, Inbound, Adobe Education Summit, and VidCon, among numerous other flagship conferences in academia and in the, in the industry. Knows, known as an education disruptor, uh, Professor I enjoys sharing her non-traditional perspective on education on various platforms and her own podcast. So I'm really happy to leave the floor to Professor I. It's a great pleasure to have you here today. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much okay. for that great introduction. And I am excited to be here. And uh, so let's talk about education and um, so this is what I am uh, uh, going to discuss today, to disrupt or be disrupted. I'd love to know a little bit more about the live audience. If you guys can let me know in the chat box, what is your industry? I, I'm just curious how many of you are actually passionate about education, really into education. So if you don't mind taking a second, let me know in the chat box, what is your background, what is your interest, that would be great. And uh, so you guys already know a lot about me. And uh, so, you know, I could just probably skip this slide. So today I am going to share three things. So where we are now in education, I will definitely be talking about the missing links in education and what is happening, like talking about trends, uh, disruptions, which is really perfect for this talk. And also I want to discuss the future, right? It is one thing to be aware of the problem, and also let's talk about the solution. So I will share with you, you know, after working in uh, spending 20 years in education, what is next, what is ahead of us, and what is the solution. So here are the places my workout features, some pictures of me. I was a college professor for 15 years, for many, many years uh, until I quit my job and started my own company. So here are some of the pictures of me. I attended hundreds of graduations for my students. This is something that my students give me, which I really appreciate. And, uh, and me speaking on stages, and it's me collaborating with Adobe. And I actually did their uh, Adobe Education Summit. I was the opening keynote speaker. Uh, this was in 2021. And uh, it was really, really big conference, 8,000 people registered. I also do lots of work with LinkedIn. So those of you who are on LinkedIn, I want to share this. LinkedIn actually has a very, uh, you know, we talk about the creator economy. So LinkedIn actually has this really amazing opportunity for creators. If you are interested, feel free to message me. Oh, sorry. And uh, so this is me giving a talk a few months ago, uh, New York City, and this is my pet. TEDx talk, if you guys are interested, feel free to check it out. So this entire talk, I discussed the broken education model. As you can see from my title, I really discussed, we have amazing teachers, but I really think it is the education model that is keeping everybody stuck. 
So this talk, I, I really discussed the broker education model. So this was an interview I did with Glamour Magazine uh, last year. It was definitely a highlight. And this is where I think the future, the future belongs to those who are disruptors. So the interview with Glamour Magazine was for their series called Daring to Disrupt. So, you know, which is, I think innovators are disruptors. What are we going to disrupt? So where are we now in education? So I want to share a few gaps and missing links. And if all of you can take out your phone for a second, I know that we are in different countries, which makes this exercise even more interesting. I am based in the United States. Uh, I'm based in uh, Washington DC and the capital. So I want you to take out your phone and to, to open Google, Google search, to enter, to type school makes me. And I, I'm curious, what are the suggested search results that you get? So this is what I got while I did this exercise. School makes me. So those suggested search results are what people search the most. Okay, you can see people don't have many positive words to use when it comes to how school is making them feel. Depressed, tired, want to cry, stressed, sick. So let me know in the chat box if you have a phone or if you have a computer, which you should, otherwise how do you watch this? That is a stupid question. So yeah, so go to your phone, your computer, just enter school makes me and let me know what you got in the chat box and uh, cry <laughs> and uh, so and also everyone thank you so much for telling me a little bit about me on to die wow yeah like i'm actually curious because we are actually in different countries so this is the global data it's not just about in the united states wow that is that is just school wants me to kill myself. But you can see where you are and where I am, we get very similar, exhausted. So far, I have not seen anything positive. It was sweet. Oh, wow, there's something positive. But this is someone who had been away from school for 50 years. Okay, so it's like 50 years ago, school, how we feel about school. It's very different because 50 years ago, there's not much information. You go to school to learn information. But nowadays in 2023, information is everywhere, right? So kill creativity, trapped. Wow. Great, and uh, you can keep this going. And I actually do this ex exercise. I have been five years really like nothing positive has actually showed up and so if you say that oh this is just what most people are maybe students parents professionals are feeling about school but i want to share with you because this is something that i have been doing over two decades an extensive body of research has really backed up this public sentiment toward school like for example According to Yale University, they did a national survey of almost 22,000 US high school students. 75% of them are feeling negative about school, including three dominant emotions, tired, stressed, and bored. So that is 75%. So almost eight out of 10 students are feeling very strongly negative about school. And speaking of TED Talk, my own TED Talk was really influenced by uh, inspired by certain Robins. For those, how many of you know this TED Talk? This is the number one watch TED Talk, like number one, 75 million views. And the title of the TED Talk is Do Schools Kill Creativity? I know someone suggested in the search, in the chat box, school kills creativity. School killed my creativity. And uh, I, I see how school is killing out many other students' creativity. So if you never watch this TED Talk, I highly recommend it was such an amazing talk. And what is really sad about this is that he did a talk two decades ago, almost nothing has, very little has changed since he did the talk. So there's more research. This one is published in The Guardian. 
talking about schools are killing curiosity and creativity. So in this uh, article, it's very interesting. So they shared a number of studies and, uh, and so they evaluated the curiosity based on how many questions that students are asking, okay? The number of questions which can be related to curiosity and creativity. When you are curious, you ask questions. I want to see how many of you are being inspired to be more curious by my talk. I will see that by the number of questions you guys are going to ask. So here's the study. So they, they studied uh, babies, 14 months to five years old. Okay, so the first paragraph. On average, so I don't know how many of you have children. If you have younger children, my youngest kid is two years old. He doesn't talk, but he, I can see he's very curious. So the youngest, this group, on average, they ask 107 questions, okay? So this is the depressing part. As children grow older, right, and by the time they get to elementary school in the United States, and every two hours, they ask about two to five questions, right? And as they grow even older, by the time they get to high school, they ask zero questions. So they stop asking questions. So from 107 questions, what curiosity, imagination, questions, to zero questions, what happened? So what happened if you read this article is that our children become educated, they become very uh, suffocated by the structure, right? Don't ask questions, listen to the teacher. This is our agenda for today. Don't get distracted. And so it's a very fascinating uh, article. So besides courting creativity and curiosity, uh, many studies and reports have also highlighted a growing skills gap among college graduates. Uh, many of you are leaders, innovators in the audience here. I wonder, maybe you can share in the chat box, do you see that in the fresh college graduates that your company is hiring? Are you seeing a decrease in their level of skills in terms of career readiness? So those are some of the studies. According to uh, SHRM, and uh, so companies are complaining that students are not learning any soft skills in college, okay? At the same time, they're also saying that students are not learning any hard skills. So they're not learning soft, they're not learning hard skills. What are they learning? Why well, I, I, I ask that question all the time. And so this is actually an article published in Forbes, uh, written by Brendan Buskit. You guys should definitely follow him on Forbes, follow him on LinkedIn. So in this article, he talks about how the importance in the United States, again, actually job for almost 50% among US young adults in the last six years. And so in the article, he cited the three reasons that contributed to this sharp decrease in the interest in college education. So the second reason is really, really relevant to our discussion today. And pay attention to what I highlighted for you. Hardly anyone believes, like nobody believes, right? The college graduates are well prepared for work. So here are the specific uh, uh, percentages. Only 13% of US adults, 11% of C-level executives, and 6% of college trustees. This shocked me, you know? College trustees are the people who are running the college. So only 6% of them actually are giving strong approvals to the work readiness of college students. And you can see the number is sadly depressing, right? So I actually interviewed the author of this Forbes article. If you guys are interested, uh, feel free, let me know, I can share the link. But in this week, you know, interview, we talked, we discussed how college is no longer the golden ticket to life readiness and career success. So this is article I actually just read two weeks ago. Oh, actually, yes, two weeks ago. It was published in the Wall Street Journal and talking about how the job market. So in this article, they discuss again, the skills gap, how college students are struggling to find a job. And I want you to really read this. This is like broke my heart. So Jim Fish, and he's the chief executive of waste management. And he said that we can't hire a truck driver to drive a truck 
blah, blah, blah. But today I can hire an MBA from a small school for $60,000 and then I can get them all day long. So can you imagine? I mean, there's nothing wrong with the driving a trash <coughs> truck, but you definitely do not need an MBA to do that job, right? So thousands of dollars invested to become a trash, trash truck driver. That is the skills gap that we're talking about. So quick summary of the skills gap of the BC links. We discussed how students are feeling negative about school, how school is hurting curiosity and the cre uh, creativity, and also again, the skills gap. So many college graduates struggle to find a job, let alone their dream jobs, right? So meanwhile, you know, we were talking about in the beginning trends. So I want to share with you uh, five trends that are actually happening right now in the industry that are going to disrupt education. So the very first trend is the rise of skills-based hiring. So this is in reference to degree-based hiring. So for so many years until, you know, like even my generation, I'm 43, uh, that's why I got a master's degree, I got a PhD, because I listened to my parents, you know, you, you, you need to get all the degrees. So that is the old way, a degree will get you a job. But things have changed a lot since you and I were students. So the number one is this trend. And I will share quickly a few articles published in Harvard Business Review, talking about the skills-based hiring. And this is another one published in McKinsey, talking about skill-based approach to, to <clears throat> building our workforce. This one is published in Work Economic Forum and talking about how we need to put skills first. And so that's the first trend, okay? Just remember that. And the parallel to that, as more and more people are hiring based on skills, there is also a decrease in demand in traditional degree-based hiring. So this was an article published in, I think in uh, Fortune magazine. And, uh, and uh, so uh, the end of last year, this article has actually gone viral on LinkedIn. That's really how I discovered this. So the CEO of LinkedIn openly you know, said that in an interview that they are using skills to replace a traditional college degree in their hiring in today's job market. That is huge disruption when you think about it, right? So we have hundreds of students. And if you think, Students are not learning some of the skills that I'm going to share with you. So they are in like, you know, there are lots of red flags. So in this article, the CEO of LinkedIn shared quite a few very insightful comments. And I highlighted a few for you, like this one, skills over degree hiring, right? And not just like uh, LinkedIn, but Google, EY, Microsoft, Apple, so many companies have joined this movement to abandon skill, uh, to abandon degree-based hiring, to adopt skill-based hiring, right? And even uh, <coughs> GM, General, uh, General Motors, has also removed their degree requirement. And so here you can see again, and uh, skills first mentality. Like how many of our students, how many today's young people actually have this skills first mentality? And uh, here, this is very fascinating. So IBM CEO, and uh, so they, uh, there's a significant job in terms of requiring a traditional four-year degree at IBM in their hiring. They used to require for uh, 95 of their positions actually require a traditional college degree, but now it has decreased into less than half. So less than 50%, okay? And this is, uh, I want you to really pay attention to the last sentence I highlighted for you. So that hires without college degrees perform just as well as PhD holders from top universities. What? Why like that? I was like slapping my own face. Why did I work so hard to get my degree? It almost doesn't make sense. How can this be the case? How can people have no college degree? They perform as well as PhD holders, not from all university, but from top universities. There must be something wrong with our education, right? If that is the case. So that was really fascinating. 
And at the same time, you know, lots of companies like, for example, IBM, they actually launched something called blue collar. Blue collar and uh, is describing uh, lots of unique positions at IBM that are open to people who don't have degrees. And you only need a certain skills and you need to do some type of training through IBM. So which is really fascinating. And, uh, oh, it's not, uh, it's not blue collar. So it is called the new color. Sorry, I misspoke. So this is in reference to the blue color and white color. So they coined a new term, which is called the new color, which I love. So this is what, what I think. This is my prediction. So when I was a student, many of us, I feel like we're similar in age. So our generation is degree-based hiring. And then slowly we move to experience-based hiring because experience comes from a specific position. But nowadays, it is very even hard to predict what positions are going to be available. So it's very hard to say, you know, this position, this experience. So we're transcending that to become skill-based hiring. I don't really care about what specific position you are going to take, but do you have this set of skills that can fulfill all sorts of positions and even positions that are not being created yet. Like my husband, his job was not even available five years ago, right? So this is where I think we're moving toward. So the third trend is very relevant to kind of what I mentioned about IBM. So the rise of industry certificates. So this was from Google. I think they launched this in 2021. And when this came out, this was a big disruption. Uh, at least in the United States. And I still remember so many college professors in the United States, they got so scared, they got so mad. And I can understand, right? They feel like Google is taking away their jobs. And uh, so what uh, Google did was that they launched their own new career certification. And uh, those career certifications are going to replace, not supplement, but to replace the traditional four-year degree in their own hiring. So this is, uh, uh, yes, they launched this in 2020. So Kent is the senior VP of global affairs at Google. And as you can see that, right? And in their own hiring in the second trade, we will now trade those new career certificates as the equivalent of a four-year degree. The implication is profound. Like, uh, you know, I run my own company. So at my company, I have students now, they don't go to college. They are exactly pursuing those alternative certifications from companies like Google, learning from Google. Absolutely amazing, right? So those are the three uh, certifications that they offer for people in project management, data science, and user experience design. And those are, uh, the salaries, you can see how much they are paying for each position. And similarly, IBM, right? And they're also launching, you know, in reference to their new color I mentioned earlier, for people who don't go have a traditional four-year college degree. And uh, so they launch their own certification. So if you go to Coursera, if you just uh, search IBM, you can see so many certifications, trainings taught by people at IBM for free. So you can learn an upskill for free. And uh, so here again, some of their certifications, many of those are for really high demand positions. And, and Google, the same thing. And you can see that uh, my, my husband works in data science. And now uh, you can see that they have lots of their own uh, certifications. So I think very soon, I think many students are already asking this question. Should I go to college to learn from professors? who don't really have any professional experience. That was my life. When I was a college professor, I had lots of academic publications. I have two advanced degrees, but I had zero, zero industry experience. And I think I, I failed my students because I didn't have any professional background. I taught them so many theories, but I didn't have any real life experience. So I think nowadays, the questions students are asking themselves is that, do I learn from a professor who don't have any professional experience or do I learn from someone at Google? Again, please do understand, I'm now trashing college professors. 
What I'm pointing out is the broken education model. Because when I became a professor, nobody taught me that real life experience is actually important. They evaluate me based on how many academic publications I have, which is important, and also based on my advanced degrees. But I think we also need to evaluate, we also need to give space, resources to support our teachers to gain professional training. Otherwise, students are going to move away from traditional college professors to learn from people like working at Google. If I want to learn technology, why don't I want to learn from Google, right? I think many students are already asking those questions. And here is the shocking part. So for the certifications that you earn from companies like Google and IBM, look at the salary. This is how much you will get paid. Already a six-figure job, even if you don't have a college degree. The same, different positions. This is also pretty decent. When I started my college professor job in the United States, I got paid $60,000 for the entire year, lower than that. And the same, and so I want to put things into context, right? So I just want you to remember, without a college degree, if you earn a certification from IBM, you got paid about 80K, and this one, six figure, okay? So here, this is a fascinating article uh, published at uh, CNBC. It's a reputable uh, publication. So they studied how much college graduates got paid five years after graduation. We're not talking about fresh college graduates, okay? Five years after graduation. You guys will be shocked. <laughs> Look at that. So those are the high paying majors, right? They are all related to computer engineering, which I think is really biased, right? Because there are so many other professions. But this is still lower compared to the certification from IBM, right? That was ATK, if you guys remember. This is the depressing part. So the worst paying college majors, look at the numbers, look at the numbers. So imagine, especially uh, education in the United States is very expensive. Four years college, you accumulate a lot of student loan, student debt, and you make about 32K a year. Just to put things into context, a minimum job, if you work cook pizza at a pizza restaurant, you get paid $15, uh, $15 per hour. So you make about 31K a year if you work at a pizza restaurant. That is almost the same amount of money a traditional college graduate is going to make after four years in college. This does not make sense. This is where the current education model is now preparing my children, your children, the young generation for a constantly disruptive market. So as I said, right, no, no wonder, remember the, the Forbes article I shared, so many students are moving away, right? So here's another trend. As the traditional education space, they're struggling to innovate, they are having a very hard time to innovate. So here is another trend. Uh, so many alternative schools. So just in, um, in the United States, there are almost 36,000 alternative schools in the United States. And when I quit my college professor job, that was my reason, one of my reasons. I wanted to disrupt the education system from the outside. I tried to disrupt from the inside, didn't work. So I was like, okay, I quit my job. I'm going to disrupt from the outside. And, but you can see the number continues to increase. And, and I have three kids. The youngest is now in the picture. And, uh, and they are 11 and nine. And uh, so we, me and my husband, we have been homeschooling them. And my oldest son just got into Stanford Online High School, a very competitive online high school. But like here's the crazy part. When you think about a school like Stanford, oh wow, they must require high test scores. But because we homeschool our children, my kids have never taken an exam in their entire life. I'm not exaggerating. They don't even know they barely do homework. They don't have lots of homework. They have never taken an exam. So how do they get into a school very competitive like Stanford Online High School because of the skills, because of the side project that I coach my own kids to do? So I want to use this as an example to show you how much things have changed. Like at least schools, the cutting edge schools, they're now just looking at the grades. 
they're looking at so much more, even for students who don't have. And uh, I still remember when my husband and I would do the application for him. My husband and I, we made up his transcript. Like, what do you think our, our son's uh, grade is for, for history, for example, for geography? I was like, oh, maybe a B. So we did that. The point is that it doesn't matter as much as it used to. But he does have, he's, he has a podcast, he started a business, he failed a business, so lots of real life skills. And I think those are the skills that are going to matter more and more in terms of hiring, in terms of college uh, admissions. And so the last trend, hold on, I'm gonna give you this time. Oh, wow. I will, I will finish this soon, okay? So that's why I will finish this uh, really fast. So the tools of AI, and I think many of you are aware of this, right? So ChatGPT, like I use AI all the time. They pass MBA exam, they pass a law exam. They are absolutely disrupting, right? Stanford students, they are also using ChatGPT to cheat your exams, things like that. This is another tool, I don't know how many of you guys know, this is actually my students told me, this is another AI tool that is absolutely fascinating. They can do math, they can do coding, they can do everything for your kids. And AI are writing books, right? All of those things. And um, so the question you need to ask is that if AI is replacing lots of the basic skills, what are the critical skills that we really need to help young people to learn and develop? You know, I truly believe AI will not replace teachers and trainers, but will replace those who don't adopt. And so what is next? And so I, I mentioned a lot. So right now you must be thinking, okay, doctor, what are the skills? What are the skills that you're talking about? So here are the skills. This is the job skills of 2023 by Coursera. It is a very comprehensive study. And uh, so those are the skills. Uh, feel free to take uh, a screenshot, okay? So what is really fascinating about this is that, cause I look at this every year, from year to year, the set of digital skills change drastically a lot because technology is changing really, really fast. But the human skills, they stay almost the same. So what I think this means is that it does not matter how fast technology changes, human skills remain constant. And you want to ask yourself, look at, I, I do this with my students all the time. I actually asked one of my students yesterday. So think about those classes you are taking at school. What are the skills you are learning, you are developing? Right? And if you couldn't check many boxes. When I was a teacher, my classes were like 300 students. Like I can tell you, nobody talked in that class. How could you even talk, practice communication skills, you know, 300 uh, class, 300 people classroom, right? So here are the top 20, uh, top 10 skills according to World Economic Forum. Feel free to take a screenshot. And uh, you will see that this page and this page, nobody mentioned memorization, exam taking, being obedient, listening to your teachers, following instructions, right? Right now, see the gap? And so the skills gap again. So this is an article published recently in Fortune Magazine talking about uh, feel free to take a screenshot. Those are the top 10 skills that our young people must master, right? So number one is creativity, creative thinking. Think about how school is killing creativity. No wonder they couldn't find a job, right? So here's another quote according to the uh, uh, Tim Cook from uh, Apple. And he said, the ability to collaborate, creativity, curiosity, and expertise. And school is killing creativity and curiosity, right? So how can we design? So one framework I, I, that I will, shut up, okay, I really, yeah. So this is a framework that I use. I know we have some educators here. You should probably already know this. It's, uh, it's called Bloom Taxonomy. And uh, so the low, uh, this is a hierarchy of learning. So the lowest level of learning is remember, which means recall facts and basic information. It is so sad. School hasn't changed since a hundred years ago when there was no internet. Students went to school to gather facts and information, but now information is everywhere. They still go to school to gather facts and information, right? So that is the lowest level of learning. 
and you want to move our young people. If you are a parent, if you are innovator, if you are a leader, you want to move your employees, uh, your team play, team members, your students to the highest level. That is to create, to produce new or original work. You can look at the verbs. They are very different. My design, assemble, as opposed to define, duplicate, recall, memorize. If your young people are doing this, they are not going to be ready for the future. This is the lower level and the, la the, the first, the top three are the higher level of thinking. And you want to move them up, not get them stuck in the remembering part. Like I will be the first one, I told my kids, I don't really care about your spelling. Like I think, you know, in the US we have like the spelling B, like memorize, your ability to memorize. I think that is obsolete. It's like nobody cares. Like I'm not very strong with my own spelling because there's Grammarly, there's a spelling check. Why? I care more about your creativity, innovation, right? So this is um, um, to really help them create original work. So this is the framework that I use at my own company and the results have been really, really amazing. And uh, so that's kind of my call to action, but right? we all have a choice to disrupt or be disrupted, right? So my favorite quote, and to end the talk, and, uh, and uh, so this one is, well, flower doesn't bloom, you fix the environment in which it grows, not the flower. So what I think of the flowers is, the flowers are our students, and the environment is the education environment. So for so many years, we label our students, you're A student, you're a B student. I'm, I'm actually right now reading another book on ADHD, just talking about how we misdiagnose so many kids. We medicate, we medicate our students. What needs to be medicated is the broken education model. Our children are just a victim, even the teachers who are all victims of a broken education model. So that is everything I'll share. And so this is my uh, QR code for LinkedIn. And so feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn. And if you are a parent, uh, uh, if you have a teenager or young adult, if you're a parent, are interested in what I'm doing, so you can schedule a free consultation with me. Uh, I will give you some advice. So that is my link to book a call. If you just have some questions, you want to stay in touch. So either scan my LinkedIn QR code or shoot me an email. Thank you so much. Dr. Ai, thank you very much. Um, we'll stop presenting and um, please make sure you guys get the LinkedIn and the barcodes for Dr. Ai. Um, Dr. Ai, we care about our kids. We want our kids to be successful. Every parent's interested in what you're talking about and they want to give their kids the best chance possible. And um, at the same time, there's tremendous pressure from everybody to try and get the kids in the top 10, top 20 schools and get that brand from Stanford or from Harvard or somewhere else. And, and those schools are still demanding and pulling students in, right? And, and they're changing. They're trying to change quickly to this new mode of learning where now they're doing flipped classrooms, team-based learning, experiential learning, and everything else. So they are adapting. It's not like they're going to go away like a dinosaur and die. They, they're learning from Coursera. They're learning from what you are talking about. Um, do you see, though, other ways to learn in college that the universities are not adapting to quickly enough because they do realize creativity, collaboration, innovation, critical thinking, problem solving are critical. And they're trying to do that, but it's so easy when nobody puts pressure on a professor, they go back and teach the old way. They mm. talk and they lecture versus mm. making them, as you said on the pyramid, create, creating things. Um, do you have some means that you think you can take from your high school, from your own homeschool training that professors could adapt into the teaching? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. I think, you know, uh, the first part of the question is that I, what are some things that are really need to be ch changed? So I think the number one we need to change is we need to change the way that we evaluate our students. So when you think about education, right, from grade one to grade two, you have to or a certain grade, a, a certain like out an A, uh, 80 or like, you know, about C, things like that to move forward. So if you fail, you got a bad grade. So when you think about that environment, we really punish failures and mistakes. So you really, you have to succeed forward. But I have, even my, my own experience, I have interviewed so many 
very successful thought leaders, entrepreneurs, almost everybody is failing forward. They are not afraid of failures. They are not afraid of mistakes. I myself, I have reframed how I look at failures and mistakes. I treat failures and mistakes as a, a muscle building opportunity. And Albert Einstein said that if you have never made a mistake, it means you have never tried anything new. So how can our education system continue to punish our students every time when they make a mistake? So I really think that I don't have a solution for that. But I think the way that we evaluate our students must be changed. And that cannot be changed when you have lecture classes like 200 students, 300 students. How can you personally evaluate everyone's project-based learning? It doesn't work, right? I know in the US, we also need to increase teacher salary. So my teachers are just so broke. When I was a teacher, I was broke. And I know that lots of teachers, they have so little resources from the school. They use money out of their own pocket to purchase some like, like erasers yeah. and pencil for the students, right? So I think that is definitely, uh, is, yeah. I see that as the root of the problem. Because almost every single student who joined the classroom that was, they have this huge fear of failures and mistakes. And including A students, sometimes A students, they have the biggest fear because they never failed in their life. And if they got to A minus, and I, their emotional resilience is very, very low. So last year, there was a group of students at uh, 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 New York University. They actually sued uh, a chemistry professor because the exams are getting so hard. Many students are failing that class. So they sued the professor and the professor lost his job. It was like a tenure, like he has been teaching for 40 years. Lost because see, yeah. like I, I really think that the evaluation system is a, is a big part. So okay. you might, you might yeah, let, go ahead. Let, let, let me try and uh, maybe bring this down to where we are. The group of people you're listening to or who's listening to you, um, they believe in certificates. They believe in, 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 a, in an education that if you put in a batch and they learn about it, you can really create a lot of value for yourself. So we believe in certificates. We also believe in our pedagogy of how you teach. We teach by learn by doing. We really believe in experiential learning as part of what we do. And we also believe in repeat cycles. So you, you quickly sprint to learn something and find all the mistakes. You sprint again to make it better. Then you sprint again and you do experiments, trial and error and this kind of things to learn from this. Um, and, and I do believe the world is changing rapidly in that front. But I wanna be clear, we cannot teach these people new things without them coming with a foundation of English, a foundation of math, a foundation of of some skills that they already come with. And so a certificate by itself is exciting, but we need other people to prepare them to be able to receive or take the certificate. And, and, and so we have, we, it's not gonna be, uh, it's an or, it'll be certificates or, it's gonna be an and. And yeah. so in, in your, um, obviously we need to prepare the schools to teach in a way that people come as collaborators, problem solvers and critical thinkers. And the schools will have to change, and the certificates won't be by themselves. So we we do believe in these things quite a bit. Um, where I'm most concerned about in terms of where we are going, though, is the pace of change of <laughs> knowledge, right? And so everything you learn is already now. I'm a consultant. Everything I used to, I am valuable because I can take unstructured data and organize it very nicely. I can now take unstructured data, put it in Chat GPT, it comes out structured. I'm not needed anymore. Consultants to a large extent are not needed, right? So as we do this, because students are getting lazier because chat GPT does the work for them. And, and as a result, they don't memorize some information which might be useful to bring at the moment. And at other moments, they are relying too much on other things. And so when they really face a true problem, a real problem that there isn't chat GPT or somebody to help you, how will we create those kind of things also. So we are in a very interesting time. And are you at all concerned about that? Yeah, I, I love everything you said. It's so good. So good. So I, first of all, have so much to say. I agree. I, I love certifications and uh, I think they are great. But my concern with the certificate, because lots of studies have also shown that when it comes to career advancement, there's a Harvard study showing that when it comes to career advancement, only 
15% comes from the hard skills. 85% comes from the soft, the human skills. So I'm really curious, right? I think most certifications are mainly learning the technical skills. And I, I think it is also important, as you mentioned, right? The basic foundational human skills, those are the skills that will actually trouble our students, keep them in trouble really, really far, the career promotion, the advancement from being a technician to the next level. So I really agree, I also want to add that. And I think with ChatGPT, like I myself have been playing with ChatGPT for so long, I really, really love it. I love how it's that unstructured and to like, I have used ChatGPT to generate lots of content for me. And what I noticed is that if you want to fully maximize the value of ChatGPT, for example, you must be good at asking questions. This is where my concern is. Our students do not know how to ask the questions. They simply yeah. do not ask questions. I think this is another area they are, maybe they're not being prepared. Remember the study I shared, and I see that in many, many college students, young graduates, my husband share with me all the time, the fresh college graduates they hire, they hire, they're always waiting. They're waiting for a specific instruction. Tell me what to do. They almost are waiting for the course syllabi, right? Give me the step one, step two, step three, and then yeah. I will do that. But I think that is where we, all of us need to think, how can we coach them or teach them to ask good questions? Dr. Tai, we've got some questions coming. I just wanted to just respond to one thing that you just said. Um, every day when my kids were going to grade school and middle school and high school, I would drop them off at school. And I would always tell them as they get out of the car, I, I would say, ask good questions. And that's all I asked them to do. I didn't ask them to do well on tests. I didn't ask them to tell me, memorize anything. I just always said, make sure you ask good questions. And, that's and amazing. I, I really believe what you said is important. Erila, you have a question. Oh, can I just add another comment about that? I'll, I'll ask the question. So I have a, I just learned this from a book. And someone mentioned that at their home, they actually have, I'm, I'm building this for myself, for my own kids, have a question wall. So it's a wall on their, uh, at their home. That whole wall is dedicated to questions. So if I have a few kids, each of them have a stack of index cards. So one is blue, another one is yellow. So throughout the week, every time when they have a question, they write up a question on the index card and they stick it to the wall. So by Friday or Saturday, everybody in the family member, they choose an index card and they do research using ChatGPT, using YouTube, using Google. And wow. but the book didn't mention textbook. So use all of those things to answer the question and do a quick family presentation by 10 minutes. So like that is such a brilliant idea. We're implementing that at home for our kids. I just want to share that. So yeah, question. Great, Erila. Okay, so mine is more like an opinion and open for debate here. Um, and I would like to know your perspective, um, AI. So uh, I think first of all, um, and I'm totally in line with what Adi said in the chat. Uh, I think, do you think that what is happening will change the mindset of the market? And when I'm talking about the market is the students and the businesses. Because for example, in US, the students have to pay super high fees annually, right? Let's say 70, 100K. And in the end, they have to get a loan and they have to pay off the loan for throughout their life, right? So if we are hiring for skills, not for a degree, why should I do this investment upfront when I'm the same, almost the same with somebody else who is, you know, has done several courses, has done like, a, uh, has learned themselves and all this. And, and will this change the mindset of students not looking only for the reputation of their degree, but going through the shortcut, you know, and thinking about how I can get this skill for a second now from the perspective of the business, right? As a business, mm -hmm. I'll have two people to choose, right? One person who hasn't done this investment, which is 300, 400K, and another person which he is educated with 10,000. Normally, this person with 400K would ask for a higher salary right? Because he has done uh, an investment. This other person will not ask, maybe will get satisfied with a lower salary. As a business, normally I get the person who, who asks for a lower salary because he has the same skills. I don't care about the reputation of the, of the Harvard or Yale, uh, maybe the networking, but still you have lots of opportunities today for networking. So taking into consideration this thing, how do you think and where do you see this trend uh, going? Yeah, uh, great question. Great to see you again. And I think definitely what is happening, the disruptions, the trends outside the classroom, absolutely causing 
disruptions at school because I know in the U.S. so many schools have just gone. Like they go back, they went bankrupt. May almost every single week when I'm on LinkedIn, because I follow lots of educators, I would say one school is closed, another school is closed for the reasons that you mentioned, right? I also know like because it just doesn't make sense. You have to train the students anyway once you hire them because they are not learning this from school. Why, you know, parents, students will think their mindset, why do I need to go this? But when it comes to education, there's whole demographic, which is parents. Lots of parents, they are fixed mindset. They have this fixed mindset when it comes to education. They feel like if my children are not going to school, that's, that's not good. So even when the students are changing, they don't want to do it, but it is the parents who are really adamant about the value of a traditional four-year degree. So there is also that. I also know in the United States, uh, there are lots of companies they will hire you and train you and pay you at the same time. And um, it is a new trend, like uh, talking about alternative school. You don't have to go to college. You come to work for me. I will teach you. I will train you. I will also pay you. So this has become a really, really, really powerful model. So I think those all of those external forces are going to eventually change. And I think it's definitely going to take a long, long, long time. And if I were, you know, in my own hurry, and I don't care about the degree. I care about the skills. I care about what you have created. And I see another trend is that you guys probably already aware of this. Like many companies are also doing like personality assessment to really understand your personality. So I think the emphasis on degrees and uh, grades are going to be like less, less and less. But I do think the big name schools, they are, not, they are going to be safe in, in a few decades. It was the, the lower tier those are the schools that are just like, I see them just disappear like almost on a weekly basis. But the big name school, they have lots of endowment, like they have lots of resources, the reputation. So yeah, so that's, I, I tell my kids, you know, I don't really care about you go to school. If you do want to go to school, you have to choose very carefully. Yeah, but you okay. remember that article I shared? Yeah, but anyway. Yeah, I'm going to say, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm interrupting. I just want to make sure we get the questions out and then we can have a, a, all the questions out there at least. We got Dr. Schultz from the Cal from Calgary from the Haskane School of Business. Dr. Schultz. Hi. Thanks. Bob Schultz, Haskane School of Business, University of Calgary. So I have received 25 teaching awards and I started in 1973, 50 years ago, doing exactly what you said. Now, the interesting part about this is it's taken 50 years for the rest of the university to catch up. But now experiential learning is part of our whole university plan. There's far more co-op jobs than there were before. The issues that I've seen, though, there's two. One is the short run issue is that COVID uh, rules that we had we had to follow dramatically reduced the the soft skills that students had because it's different seeing people on a screen and you don't stand around you don't talk uh, as you would to build skills that that slowed the students down um, as well. One of the problems that I've seen is because I'm also on the board of directors of RoboGarden, which has certified skills from kindergarten through professional certification for um, C plus C sharp Java, JavaScript and Python, all the things, all the skills that are wanted. Here's the problem. The banks want to give loans to students for a four year degree. They don't want to give loans for the skills and they can give a lower amount of loan with a greater probability of getting paid back, greater probability of a job and less money at risk for the bank. I don't get it. So I'm starting to ask now to the banks, what are you thinking? And so, so I'm on the same page you have, and I've been there for a long time. The mm -hmm. other part that's tricky is that, that I and mean, one of the things you might want to look at is what Grace and Bass is doing with Jimmy for Kids, because that's right along the kinds of things that you're thinking about, as well as stempower.org in Africa. Now it's 100 centers, and it's all hands-on, uh, not the math part of science. So there's, there's, there are some innovations going on, uh, and so I think we're all on the same page. Uh, the only thing I want to question, though, is Coursera. Something like 95% of the students never finish the courses. They start and don't finish. And so they tell their parents they're taking courses at Harvard and Stanford, and the parents think that's great. Well, that's a Coursera course. That's not a regular course. And so there's a certain amount of lying and truth bending that the students are presenting to their parents. So anyway, so I really enjoyed your discussion. I'm on the same page you are. Hope we can continue, uh, continue connecting. Uh, thank you so much. I definitely want to connect with you, Bob, on LinkedIn. So maybe get the links and resources. Yeah, yeah. I know. Like, I think uh, the problem is, of course, and this is where, you know, uh, like teachers are so valuable because 
like research has shown that when you are just watching like uh, self-paced pre-recorded videos, it's very hard to complete. And myself, I like I even though I feel like I'm a motivated person, I struggle with courses that have not much live human interaction. It's very very challenging to complete. So I can definitely and definitely definitely see that. Yeah. Good, Bob. Thank you for that. Um, any if there's any other questions, please put your hand up and we'll get you going. Um, I want to share with you, Dr. I, something that we did that might be also helpful. So I'm going to share a, a slide. And just let me know if you can see it first. Um, can you see it? Yes. Mm -hmm. So we, we did a study, which was basically the last couple of months. And we asked, what does the industry need? We also asked what the academics are focusing on. So what does Google, Amazon, Microsoft test is looking for? We asked what academia was, was looking for in terms of what they were going to teach, be teaching going into the future. And as we talked through those things, we interviewed or we discussed or we did research of what the quotes were and everything else. And we came down to these five skills, which are the ones of the future. They're basically saying we need people who know innovation, which is what you said, creativity, which is what you said, critical thinking, right on target. But this last two are very important, collaboration, communication, which you did say with storytelling and, 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 and teamwork. And so yeah. all this... People on the left hand side are ultimately saying that we will need to forget what we learn, but we'll have to learn how to learn on the left hand yeah. side. So whatever, whatever you're learning is not going to be useful as a hard skill. Hard skills will have to be unlearned, but the soft skills yeah. will always be available to you for the future. And these five skills are what Harvard, Stanford, MIT, Michigan, and other good schools are out there trying to teach the students catching up on the needs of the future. Yeah. Oh, this is so good. I, I absolutely love it. I love to love it. And I want to, you know, I just want to make, make uh, some comments regarding, like, for example, communication. So many people, young people, they struggle with communication. And I think real communication happens when you are in a mixed age environment. And I don't know how to solve this problem. When you look at college, most students are mainly talking to their peers. Right, they don't really have. That's a, a important reason that we decide to homeschool our kids, so they have a wide range of mixed age environment. And I think you can't really truly practice communication while only talking to your peers. You really have to learn to adapt in an environment where you have people speak different languages, different accent, who are older than you, who are younger than you. This is where experiential based learning internships, learning outside the classroom, are becoming really valuable. Yeah, yeah, but anyway, I just want to make that comment. Yeah. Dr. I, um, we're coming to the hour. It's almost 10 o'clock for us, or so the end of the hour. And um, I want to, first of all, say I think you are provoking us into recognizing that the change is coming. It's coming faster than we believe. And we need to be rethinking how we teach our kids so that they don't lose the creativity. They don't lose the problem solving. They continue to be creative and hands-on and things like that. And we hear that message loud and clear. We also recognize that industry is changing in terms of how they're going to be hiring people in the future. And you're also warning all the universities, especially the bottom tier schools, that they are under threat of never of not being around for the next three to five years. The bigger universities, stronger brands will probably survive uh, for a while. You said a couple of 10 to 20 years is what I heard you say. And um, and that's, that's, that's the watch out for all of us. But from the Jimmy community, we are in a good position because we are in certificates. We are in experiential learning. We are teaching creativity, innovation, collaboration, the things that you're talking about. So I, I think we are very aligned in your messages. So we, we are feeling pretty happy that we are in the right place at the right time right now. And what I would like to do is give you the last minute. You have the last minute, your last advice to everybody, to, to whatever message you want to give, please do that. Case for change, call for action, whatever it is. It's, you have the last minute. Thank you. <laughs> so pressure here. I think the most, uh, the best way that we want to talk about innovation, creativity, and change is that we be the change that we want to see in our own environment. And when I wanted to change education, I became the change that I wanted to see in the classroom, right? Regardless of what we do as a teacher, as a leader, uh, as a you know influencer, as a marketer, why don't we all embody this belief that we be the change that we want to see in our own environment? Wonderful. Dr. I, lots of wisdom, lots of insights. And as a result, I hope for all of you in the audience, insights into actions. Put this into practice. 
and Dr. I's learning and messages will then be well worth. Thank you very much. We wish you best of luck in what you're doing. And we would like to invite you again and again back to our events and meetings in the future. Thank you very much.